welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Dinah Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is Voyager Read Along Week 25, Episode 67. And what am I covering this week? Well, I'm covering only Chapter 62, so guess what that means? One more week of the read along. When I originally made my dates for every chapter and how much I was recording, when I looked at the final two chapters, what I saw was the page number for the start of chapter 63. And in my head, I said, oh good, 25 pages for two chapters. Now you'd think since I'd read this book several times before, I would have caught that before I sat down to write notes this week. But no, I didn't. So I didn't include chapter 63 in the amount of pages I would be doing notes on this week. So you get one more week of the read-along. It's my pleasure and my miscalculation. That's exciting. The next episode will be the final read-along episode before we start The Scottish Prisoner. And I promise, 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 I will get the schedule up for you this week. So what happened in Outlander World? Well, Outlander won four categories for the People's Choice Awards. So, as always, best fans ever, as they like to say. And after that, Sam and Katrina did a live Facebook chat. So you can find the recorded video if you haven't watched it yet. It's on the Outlander Stars Facebook page. I also posted it on the A Dram of Outlander Facebook page and Twitter for you to find. Nothing new really came out of it. However, they're effable and cute and fun as always and very entertaining. It's worth your 20 minutes. So let's dive right in. Chapter 62, Abendawe. What a fun word is that to say. I could say it all the time. I wish I could actually fit it into everyday lexicon, but that's just not possible. This chapter opens with the Jamie and John show. Remember... They had to decide what they were doing and that they would need help. Well, this is the help they're seeking. So Jamie goes to the governor, Lord John Gray, and it's under the guise that he will steal or borrow the much needed boat in order to make it look like John is not involved. Because there's already been a host of trouble since John took over as governor. You know, a little thing about a killer running loose. And the other part of that is those fires that Jamie and Claire saw in the last chapter as they were leaving that really interesting voodoo tea party. Those four plantation homes that were burnt also meant that more than 200 slaves had left. And John says, because of this, but I vastly doubt that anyone will take notice of my social acquaintance under the circumstances. Between fear of the Maroons and fear of the Chinamen, the whole island is in such a panic that a mere smuggler is the most negligible of trivialities. Oh, I love Lord John Gray. And I will not lie about it. <laughs> Jamie snickers, sort of, and he likes being trivial, but he'll steal the boat all the same, just in case they get caught. John never has seen or heard of him. Is that right? What should be taken? Watch them hang you and keep quiet about it for fear of smirching my reputation. For God's sake, Jamie, what do you take me for? Jamie's mouth twitched slightly. For a friend, John. And if I'll take your friendship and your damned boat, then you'll take mine and keep quiet, I. The governor glared at him for a moment, lips pressed tight, but then his shoulders sagged in defeat. I will, but I should regard it as a great personal favor if you would endeavor not to be captured. <laughs> Jamie rubbed a knuckle across his mouth, hiding a smile. I'll try very hard, John. So we get to see what their relationship looks like in real life. And Claire is also watching this. Now she knows that Lord John is hopelessly in love with Jamie. That has to be a bit awkward. And Clara is fairly possessive of her spouse. <laughs> and 
So Lord John Gray gives Jamie some sage advice and tells of where the military is focusing, trying to keep the Maroons at bay. Jamie and Claire know better that the Maroons took over the Bruja and were likely heading to join with the follower and were likely headed to join up with the followers of Bruasa on Hispaniola. The people of Kingston had nothing to fear from them, but better for them to focus there than toward Hispaniola, where Claire and Jamie needed to go. And as they set to leave, John asks if there doesn't need to be a secure place for his Mrs. Fraser to stay. <laughs> Jamie hesitated, but there was no gentle way to phrase it. She must go with me, John. There's no choice about it. She must. Gray's glance flickered to her, then away, but not before she had seen the jealousy in his eyes. Claire feels sorry for him, but there was nothing she could say and no way to tell him the truth. Yes, I see quite. John bids Jamie good luck and for God to go with him. Poor John. I think he uses his love for Jamie, this unrequited love, to stop him from moving forward since Hector died at Culloden 20 years prior. It's a wall he uses to surround himself with. He cannot be vulnerable with anyone else, or he might get hurt. He stays in this constant low level of wanting instead of putting himself at risk. Now, I'm sure John takes lovers here and there, and... He has a wife that now he doesn't see at all, but he practiced to make sure he could do it, even if he didn't want to or like it. But has he ever fallen in love with someone since? It takes a lot of work to keep that depth of emotion and connection with somebody that you cannot have. What do you think about that? It makes me feel a bit sad for John because I think he has so much to offer and yet he keeps it to himself. He spends it pining for somebody who is a straight, again, married man. After they leave Lord John Gray's office, Jamie and Fergus argue. Fergus is angry that Jamie won't take him but it's taken all the Scottish smugglers. And Jamie looks at Marcelie. I thought she was over young to be wed, and I was wrong. But I know she's over young to be widowed. You'll stay. And that was that. I can hear Fergus saying, Yes, my lord. Oh. So when it becomes full dark, they leave on Gray's borrowed boat. The two docksmen are bound and gagged in the boathouse. It's a small ship, but it's bigger than a fishing boat, but definitely not large. Claire is going through and giving all her descriptions. This is one of the ways in her tells that she is uncomfortable and she might be anxious and worried is because she starts paying attention, remember? Good thing she would make an awesome witness. So they left Kingston Harbor, and they're heading to Hispaniola. The crew handle everything, leaving Lawrence Stern, Claire, and Jamie at the rail, chatting until they become absorbed in their own thoughts. And Jamie yawns. Claire urges him to lie down on the bench with his head in her lap. But she and Lawrence were too wakeful to rest. Lawrence talks about the weather, and it's boring enough to soothe Claire's nerves as she strokes Jamie's hair. What a nice visual that is. Imagine him laying on her lap, and Lawrence is talking. It's sort of mindless, but Claire is stroking his hair. She remarks how well he and Jamie can read the sky. He says many signs are reliable. Of course, there are signs involved in the reading of it. And then Claire posits, but what about odd phenomena, supernatural things? 
What about the things where the rules of science seem not to apply? I am a scientist, she remembers him saying, and that he didn't believe in ghosts. Claire goes on to ask him about the things she remembered from Galus's book. Stigmata, astral projection, visions, supernatural manifestations that can't be explained rationally. Lawrence is intrigued, and he's sensing a longer conversation now, so he settles onto the bench beside her. Well, I say it's the place of science only to observe, he said, to seek cause where it may be found, but to realize that there are many things in the world for which no cause shall be found, not because it does not exist, but because we know too little to find it. It's not the place of science to insist on explanation, but only to observe in hopes that the explanation will manifest itself. That may be science, but it isn't human nature, she objected. People go on wanting explanations. They do. It is for this reason that a scientist constructs hypothesis, suggestions for the cause of an observation. But a hypothesis can never be confused with an explanation, with proof. I have seen a great many things which might be described as peculiar. Fish falls, for instance, where a great many fish, all of the same species, mind you, all the same size, fall suddenly from a clear sky over dry land. There would appear to be no rational cause for this, and yet, and yet, is it therefore suitable to attribute the phenomenon to supernatural interference? On the face of it, does it seem more likely that some celestial intelligence should amuse itself by flinging shoals of fish at us from the sky, or that there is some meteorological phenomenon, a water spout, a tornado, something of the kind, that while not visible to us, is still in operation? And yet, why and how might a natural phenomenon such as a water spout remove the heads, and only the heads, of all the fish? Have you seen such a thing for yourself, she asks, and he laughs. He loves that she has a scientific mind. How do you know? How do you believe it? Were you near a seashore or a lake? Twice he was by water and happened to have a frog phenomenon. But the third time with fish, he was far away from the water. And there was no meteorological event going on. And then he goes into something interesting. They discuss seeing and believing and not seeing and not believing. It may be so, it may not, but a scientist could not say, could he? What is it the Christian Bible says? Blessed are they who have not seen but have believed? That's what it says, yes. Some things must be accepted as fact without probable cause. He laughs, but not with humor. As a scientist who is also a Jew, I have perhaps a different perspective on such phenomena as stigmata, and the idea of resurrection of the dead, which a very great proportion of the civilized world accepts as fact beyond question. And yet, the skeptical view is not one I could even breathe to anyone save yourself, without grave danger of personal harm. Doubting Thomas was a Jew, after all, to begin with. Yes, and only when he ceased to doubt did he become a Christian and a martyr. One could argue that it was surety that killed him, no? There is a great difference between those phenomena which are accepted on faith and those which are proved by objective determination, though the cause of both may be equally rational once known. And the chief difference is this, that people will treat with disdain such phenomena as are proved by the evidence of the senses and commonly experienced while they will defend to the death the reality of a phenomenon which they have neither seen nor experienced. And this is a very interesting line that comes up. And I know I've read a lot of what's in the text because it all matters. Faith is as powerful a force as science, but far more dangerous. Let's look at that for a moment. Perhaps in the 18th century, I could say without a doubt, that statement in his mind could be very true. Numerous thousands of people had died under the name of 
a Christian God, an Islamic God, different types of churches, inquisitions. It was incredible. Many people died. But with science, where it is in the modern world, I look at that quote and I think it still happens. People die. And it can be dangerous in faith, whether because of their faith or for their faith. But science also kills people. Or those wielding science kill people. Many have been experimented on, whether they knew it or not, and they've died for the sake of furthering science. I think both can be dangerous. And I would love to hear your feedback on that because you know how much I love science. But I think that science has replaced faith and religion for many people. And that's okay, but that's still their religion. But it's not without need to be curbed or watched. There has to be checks and balances. And science just can't go wild. It's ethically challenging. It's morally challenging. But I would love to hear what you think about that because reading that, I understand how people say that with so much blood on the ground because of a god or gods and belief systems that will end up having others persecuted. It's difficult. But science doesn't get off totally easy either. And we learn that where he saw the phenomena, the fish, the headless fish, is on Hispaniola. And for some reason, it seems like this place, things like that happen a little more often. Claire begins to think of Ishmael, young Ian and Galus. And she asked if he had seen trace of any of the Scottish boys on the plantation when they searched it. Lawrence hesitated and mulled it over. But then Jamie answered. He says they found him, but he refuses to tell her anything more about it. What does that mean to you, Timmy? That means he found the remains of these dead boys. And it was gruesome. And she had hoped that Ishmael was right, that Galus had taken young Ian. It had to be true. And then she touches Jamie's head and whispers, Blessed are they who have not seen, but have believed. That's fascinating, because Claire has never been like Jamie in faith. Jamie has a deep and abiding faith. He relies on it. And Claire, I think for her it grows. But she's always a bit of a skeptic, and she does have a scientific mind. But she also knows that supernatural things happen, and she's experienced it herself. So there must be more. It can't just be what we see. So they dropped anchor off the northern coast of Hispaniola. And Claire describes all that she sees. It's a new place. She's putting it into context. Jamie carries her several footsteps ashore then turns back toward Innes, who was carrying a parcel of food. I thank you, Ahedich. We shall part here. With the Virgin's blessing, we will meet here again in four days' time. Innes was disappointed, but agrees to watch over the boat. Innes thinks only he is to be left behind because he's one-armed, but Jamie explains it's all of them save for Claire, Lawrence, and himself. Innes is stunned, and it looks like a fearsome adventure, and he might need all of them. Finally, he acquiesces with a, well, it's as you shall say, McDew, but you can we're willing, all of us. I like Duncan Innes. And file him into your memory banks. He might just prove important. Jamie holds out an arm and Duncan awkwardly embraces him. And he leaves instruction if another ship comes that they are to leave, reminding him the Royal Navy is looking for the pinnace. And leave you here? Nay, 
You can order me to do a great many things, McDo, and do them I shall, but not that. Jamie said he must do as he says. Then he goes to say goodbye to the other men, and though unhappy, Duncan doesn't protest further. It was hot and damp as they walked through the jungle. They didn't speak much and couldn't talk in front of Lawrence about Brianna, obviously. And they couldn't make any plans until they saw Abendawe and what was there. When they made a camp for the night, and Claire sleeps, fitfully waking to see Jamie leaning on a tree, just staring. They reached the place at noon the second day, and on the hill, Claire sees standing stones. And she looks at Lawrence. You didn't say there was a stone circle. She feels faint. Lawrence asks if she's okay. She says she is, but Jamie is there right away. For God's sakes, be careful, Sassanok. Didn't go near those things. She says they must know if Gailey is there with Ian. Again, I don't know why the switch up between Galus and Gailey. It's a mystery. She makes herself move forward, and he holds on to her. She hears him muttering in Gaelic. She thinks he's praying. Lawrence goes on to explain the aboriginal inhabitants placed them there. They are very old. The circle was empty and innocent looking. Gives me the shivers. And Jamie asks if she can hear the stones. She's unsure. And the dates are off. It's not a sun or a fire feast. They may not be open. But Claire reaches out to touch a stone. Holding tightly to Jamie's hands, she edges forward, listening. There seemed to be a faint hum in the air, but it might be no more than the usual sound of the jungle insects. Very gently, she laid the palm of her hand against the nearest stone. I was, dim I was dimly conscious of Jamie calling my name. Somewhere my mind was struggling on a physical level, making the conscious effort to lift and lower my diaphragm, to squeeze and release the chambers of my heart. My ears were filled with a pulsating hum, a vibration too deep for sound, that throbbed in the marrow of her bones. I was dimly conscious of Jamie calling my name. Somewhere my mind was struggling on a physical level, making the conscious effort to lift and lower my diaphragm, to squeeze and release the chambers of my heart. My ears were filled with a pulsating hum, a vibration too deep for sound that throbbed in the marrow of my bones. And in some small, still place in the center of the chaos was Gailey Duncan, green eyes smiling into mine. And Jamie yells, Claire! She was lying on the ground, and they were bending over her. And she says, Gailey is nearby. She heard her. She saw her. Whatever. And when she comes to, he asks if she can tell where, and she tries to see it in her mind, in a cave, she thinks, and asks Lawrence if it is close by. Do you think this freaks out Lawrence just a little bit? Did she start to disappear? Like, what happened? We don't know. Claire tells Jamie Gailey knows she's here as well. He stops and utters in Gaelic. Blessed Michael, defend us from demons. Amen, Jamie. In the cave, it was pitch black. The floor is uneven, and there were some tiny spaces to squeeze through in areas, and she was wondering how Gailey squeezed through. Even where the passage was wider, Claire says it felt like being in a dark room with someone silent. You could feel their presence never more than an arm reach away. Jamie has a tight hand on her shoulder. He's close behind her. And then he asks if they are going the right way, since there are other passages they are passing by. She says she can hear them. I can hear. Hear them. It. Don't you hear? It was a struggle to speak to form coherent thoughts. The call here was different. Not the beehive sound of Craig Nadoon, but a hum like the vibration of the air following the striking of a great bell. But a hum like the vibration of the air following the striking of a great bell. I could feel it ringing in the long bones of my arms, echoing through the pectoral girdle and spine. Jamie grips her arm. Stay with me. 
that's enough. Don't let it take you. Stay. He, she reaches, and then he pulls her tight against his chest. Jamie, Jamie, hold on to me. Don't let me go. If it takes me, Jamie, I can't come back again. It's worse every time. It will kill me, Jamie. She must be terrified being in this space. This actually made me tear up when I went through it in my note-taking. I can feel how desperate she is and how horrible and difficult this must be for her. And then he hugs her so tightly she can't breathe. And when he lets her go, he moves in front of her, one hand always upon her, and he tells her to hold on to his belt. They were linked together, moving further into the cave. Jamie had refused to allow Lawrence to come. He was waiting at the opening. If they didn't return, he was to go back to the rendezvous point. Jamie stops, and he draws her beside him. He has something to say, and she thinks she already knows. If it will be a choice between her and one of us, then it must be me. You know that, I. Why sacrifice Jamie if needed? Well, Claire could follow Galus through the stones. He couldn't. That's it. And his unspoken words said, if she were not there, Claire would have to go through to follow and find Galus on the other side. They would both again do what was necessary. They would sacrifice their relationship if needed again. These two do the right thing. Sometimes it looks like chaotic adventure. It's bananas. But they're the kind of people, they're that guy. They will do what's necessary, when necessary. Then kiss me, Claire. I know that you're more to me than life, and I have no regret. She kissed him first on the hand, then the wrist, then on the mouth. Haven and promise and anguish all mingled, and the salt of tears and the taste of him. Isn't that a beautiful line? Haven and promise and anguish all mingled, and the salt of tears and the taste of him. That's beautiful. Thank you, Diana Gabaldon. Then she let go, turning to the left and said this way, another ten yards, and there was light. She almost sobbed in relief. She felt like a ghost taking shape as she walked toward the light. There's that theme again. Jamie moves in front of her, ducking into a good-sized chamber. And Galus greets them. So you came, did you? And she was drawing a line on the floor with white powder. Jamie made a sound. He had seen young Ian. Ian was in the middle of the pentacle, bound and gagged. Next to him was an axe. Claire notices all the detail. This is high, stressed Claire. Gailey told Jamie not to come closer. She had a pistol in her hand and one in her belt. She watched him as she reached into her pocket for more diamond dust. She was sweating. The hum was affecting her, too. Claire began to feel sick, and sweat ran down her body. The pentacle pattern was complete, the gems already placed. And Gailey says the diamond dust keeps out the noise. Then she pats Ian, and he is wide-eyed with terror. There, there, McCreer. Dinner prepped. It will be over soon. Jamie, of course, is having none of it. Take your hand off him, you wicked bitch. He steps forward, but she raises the pistol at him. You mind me of your Uncle Dougal. A Shinnok. He was older when I met him than you are now, but... You have the look of him about your eye, like you'd take what you pleased and damn anyone who stands in your way. I'll take what's mine, he said softly. But you cannot now, can you? One more step and I'll kill you dead. I'll spare you now, only because Claire seems fond of you. A life for a life, sweet Claire. You tried to save me once in Craig Nadoon. I saved you from the witch trial at Crane's Muir. We're quits now, I. She then poured brandy over Ian's clothes. He bucks wildly in response. She's going to light him on fire? And she kicks him in the ribs, yelling for him to be still. Claire tells her not to do it. She says she has to. She's meant to. She'll take the girl but leave the man. 
meaning she'll go after Brianna in the future but leave Jamie for Claire. It's that damned Fraser of Lovett prophecy. Jamie doesn't know what this means and asks what girl. And she says, Brianna, the last of Lovett's line. Lucky they went to see her because she thought they all died out before 1900. Horror ran through Claire and she thinks Jamie too. Gailey saw it too. She cried out as he lunged at her, and then she shot. He reached for her throat and then collapsed across the edge of the pentagram. Ian moaned. Claire has no idea what she said, but she felt it in her throat, and it startled Gailey. In this moment, Claire recalls a time when her car had been sideswiped, when Brianna was little. She had gone out of the car after checking on Brianna to make sure she was okay. And when she approaches the man in the car that hit her, he looks at her and rolls up his window quickly. In that moment, she knew she would and could shatter the window with her hand and drag the man out through it, and he knew it too. The police arrived and brought her back to her normal sense, and she shook, but the look on the man's face was etched in her memory. Gailey's face looked much the same as the man's, even in the dim light. She knew what was coming for her. Gailey shot at Claire with the other gun, but she had secured the axe from the floor. And she notices the leather binding, its pattern. She's in that hypersensitive state. She heard a noise behind her but didn't turn. She saw red, the red thing that Jamie had called it, when you have no choice but to kill and he said he had given himself to it. Claire didn't have to give herself to it. It had taken her. There was no fear, no rage, no doubt, only the strike of the swinging axe. The blow reverberated up her arm and she drops the axe. Gailey came toward her, bleeding. And Claire thinks, huh, blood is black in firelight, not red. It's that disassociation clinical thing that Claire does. And I always noticed her doing it, but until doing this read-along with you all, I didn't notice how much she does it, and that's where we get most of our detail from. It's in these states of her being in trouble or something going on, where she has to be hyper-aware of everything. Gailey took one step before falling without even trying to stop herself just like Reverend Campbell. Her eyes showed she knew death was coming. Claire now heard someone speaking behind her, but the loud buzzing was so much louder. And the torchlight flickered like a dark angel's wings. The sound came again from behind her. Jamie was on his knees. His head was bleeding. It was just a flesh wound. She thought she needed to stop the bleeding, but he was already over to young Ian, loosening the bindings, and Ian was on his feet, helping his uncle. Jamie takes the cloth from her hand and wipes his face, then tells her to come. There was a terrible storm brewing outside. She turned to look over her shoulder, but he pushed her forward. With a draft of wind, the torch went out, and she could no longer see what was in the cave. Ian sounded terrified, and he exclaimed, Jesus, Uncle Jamie! He told Ian to come near him, and it was okay. It's just the cave breathing. How does Jamie know these things? This scared Claire even more now. She could feel the breath upon her. Ian was scared, too, and clung to Claire. Good job, Jamie, like telling ghost stories to five-year-olds. <laughs> they were linked together. They made their way back through the winding tunnel. All the while, the ghostly wind whined at their backs. Oh, makes me cold just thinking about this cave. I shiver. They could see nothing. Claire tried to force her mind from what lay behind. I can hear her. Young Ian's voice rose in panic. I can hear her. God, oh God, she's coming. Claire consciously knew it was only the wind, but the terror clenched her, and she screamed. Then Jamie held her and Ian close. 
She was thankful for his scent and touch. Hush, he said fiercely. Hush, the both of you. I would not let her touch you, never. Then he squeezed them closer. He assures them it's only the wind and tells them to come. It's only a storm. By the time they reached the entrance, the rain had passed. And they came out to this bright sunshine from this cave. It was like being reborn, probably. Or a blind person regaining sight. Lawrence springs to his feet. Lawrence springs to his feet when he sees them, and he's relieved. And Jamie introduces young Ian Murray, his nephew, to Lawrence. Young Ian is such a sweet boy, he thanks Lawrence for helping find him. I knew you'd come, Uncle Jamie, but you left it a bit late, I. He smiled, then trembled, fighting back the tears. Jamie apologizes for being so late and calls him a volick and embraces him. Oh, it's so sweet. I just want to snuggle them all. They've been through a hell of a lot of stuff in the last so many days. I mean, remember, it's just been, what, a day since Yi Chen Cho killed the Reverend, and then we had the whole crocodile and the whole voodoo tea and the run-in with Margaret Campbell. There's a lot happening here. They don't get a lot of re emotional recovery time, so I'm glad they have to go in a boat or go do other things or camp out because they have to sleep. <laughs> they have to have a little distance. Lawrence asks after Claire. She's unsure if she's okay. Everything seems unreal and she feels disconnected. It's almost as if it was difficult to understand them. And he suggests they leave without even asking about Mrs. Abernathy. Claire agrees with this notion and turns to walk away, not waiting for the men. <laughs> She's hightailing it out of there. <laughs> As they walked, she felt more and more remote. Again, this is a tremendous amount of experiences. And she had to kill Galus, or Gailey, Mrs. Abernathy. She didn't have a choice. So let's take a pause for a moment. Do you remember way, way back, about five and a half months ago in the read-along, when Joe Abernathy punked Claire at work, and he had a skeleton brought in from the what, history department? And it wasn't fresh, and he had Claire read the bones, and she said it was a woman about such and such a size, she didn't know she was going to die. Who do you suppose that skeleton belonged to that was found in a cave in the West Indies? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Claire didn't know it yet, but that was Galus. And Claire was going to kill her, and she didn't know. And how much you want to bet... That Joe Abernathy, because we kept hearing about Ishmael's voice, that Joe Abernathy came from Ishmael and what? As someone said on the Twitter chat this past week, maybe Margaret Campbell? Because Claire made a reference to the fact that Joe looked a lot more like her than he did those who just came from Africa. Kapow! I remember when I realized that Galus was the woman in the cave that was the skeleton that Joe had Claire read the bones. Amazing. I mean, there's more things that will come out in like four books. Detail that you'll come across and be like, wait, where did I know that from? And you'll have to go through the ebook version so you can search, so you can find the information you're looking for. Pretty awesome. Thank you, Diana. So the mystery of the skeleton from the cave in the West Indies has been settled. So they stopped by a stream to make their camp for the night. Lawrence was a really good person to have camping. He could build shelter and forage for edibles. Then Ian was sent to gather firewood. 
And at this point, Claire sits down with a bowl of water to tend to Jamie's head. And she's following the entrance wound, and there's no exit wound. The bullet had traveled from entering, and it went down toward the back of his head. And she found this tender lump. It had come to rest under his skin just at the occiput. The occiput is the crown of the head, top back. And here's Claire's response to this. Jesus H. Christ! You've always said your head was solid bone, and I'll be damned if you weren't right. She shot you point blank, and the bloody ball bounced off your skull. <laughs> Jamie kind of snorted and groaned. Aye, well, I'll no say I'm not thick-hided, but if Mistress Abernathy had used a full charge of powder, it wouldn't have been nearly thick enough. <laughs> now this goes back to the very first book, when his oh lovely Uncle Dougal had tried to kill him. It doesn't hurt him much, but he has a terrible headache. Claire shaves the area, cleans it with alcohol, then slices it open with a small scalpel on the count of three breaths. She says, three deep breaths and hold on tight. I'm going to cut you, but it will be fast. So after she cuts in, she put pressure under the ball until it popped out. It fell into her hand like a grape. See, I could totally do this. I still don't know if I'd want to take out that worm from an eyeball, but this wouldn't bother me at all. She dropped the misshapen ball into his hand and smiled. Souvenir! And then she wraps his head. Then when she finishes, she just begins to cry. And he asks if she's all right. She says she doesn't know why she's crying. I know why she's crying. All of the things. And she killed Galus. And they found young Ian. And Jamie was shot. And she was totally affected by the stones being near. And, and, and. It's been a terrifically difficult few days. All those emotions have to release somehow. They have to go someplace. That experience must be abated. So he holds her and he rocks her, telling her it will be all right. And all of a sudden, she was back in her body. She was warm and shaking. And she's feeling her iron core dissolve into tears. She's tough as nails. She's great in an emergency. But it's powerful, and we can't hold that in. And so Jamie grounded her again, and she's back part of the earth, part of reality. And she slowly and gradually stops crying, and she's left with only peace and comfort from Jamie's presence. She realizes that Lawrence and Ian had returned, and she doesn't care at all. And Ian remarked that Jamie was bleeding down the back of his neck. And Jamie asked him to place a new bandage. I must just hold your auntie now. At some point, she fell asleep in his arms. Do you have anyone or anything that is grounding like that for you? Where no matter what is going on, it returns you to a normal placement? Only my husband can do that for me. Later, when she wakes, she is curled next to Jamie on a blanket. And she hears snoring in the distance and assumes it's Lawrence because she can hear Ian talking on the other side of Jamie. And he was telling Jamie about his time on the Bruja, and it really wasn't so bad and they were not mistreated. But from the ship, they went to Rose Hall and were warmly welcomed by Mrs. Abernathy and placed in a brand new prison. It was the basement below the sugar mill Jamie had been right, and it had been outfitted for it. The boys had no idea why they were there. Now, as we go forward with all of Ian's descriptions, what kind of relationship do you think he and his Uncle Jamie have? Because he is brutally honest. He doesn't hold anything back. And Claire is sitting right there, so he must trust them implicitly. And it's not just because they crossed half of the earth all those months and months on a ship. 
and they cross the ocean for months and months on a ship and they never stop searching for him. That must make him feel loved and wanted and cared for. But the relationship had already been established. He really trusts his Uncle Jamie. So Mrs. Abernathy and Hercules, or Atlas, would visit them sometimes, and she refused to tell them why they were there. And then she'd proceed to choose a boy and take them with her. The boys nearly always did not come back, and this knowledge scared them. Eight weeks after arriving, it was young Ian's turn to go with her. Three boys had been taken and not returned. And of course, he fought back. He kicked and bit Hercules or Atlas. Then he was clouded on the head and carried off. First, he was taken to the kitchen, washed, dressed in a clean white shirt and nothing else. Then taken to the main house. Remember, he's 15. My youngest is 15 right now. It was at night. And the main house was lighted, and it reminded him of Lollybrock, and it almost broke his heart to see it. Hercules, or Atlas, took him to Mrs. Abernathy's room. She wore a gown with odd figures embroidered upon the hem. She gave him an ill-smelling drink, but he had no choice, so he drank it. That reminds you of Ishmael giving Claire the cup? He sat in one of the two chairs, and she asked some questions about his home, his family, names of his whole family. That's why Galus was not surprised to see them at all. Claire's hunch had been right. She had asked all sorts of things, and if he'd ever lain with the lassie, just as though she were asking did he have parrots for his breakfast. How improper of her. He didn't want to answer her, but couldn't help it. Yes, yeah, she had drugged him with that drink. And Jamie asked if he told the truth. He did. He told her lots of things, even about Edinburgh, the print shop, the seamen, the brothel, Mary, everything. And she did not like that answer, and he grew very afraid. He would have run, but he couldn't, for his limbs were heavy, and a giant, you know, guarded the door. She said he was ruined since he wasn't a virgin. What business did a boy of his age have going with the lassies anyway? He spoiled himself. Then she drank a glass of wine, and that cooled her temper. Then she decided maybe he was good for other uses. Jamie did not like to hear this at all. But young Ian went on. Well, she, she took my hand and made me stand up. And she took off my shirt I was wearing, and she, I swear it's true, Uncle, she knelt on the floor in front of me and took my cock in her mouth. She sexually assaulted a 15-year-old boy. Jamie gripped Claire's shoulder, but his voice remained mild, and asked him to go on. Did Galus make love to him? Love? Ian says no. She did all these things to him, but it wasn't like with we Mary at all. He says, God, it felt queer. When she was doing her business, she asked the large black man to hold the candle at a better angle so she could see what she was doing better. And then Ian drank from one of the bottles and sighed. Uncle, have you ever lain with a woman when you didn't want to do it? Jamie hesitated and then said, I, Ian, I have. Oh. Do you ken how it can be, Uncle? How you can do it and not want a bit, and hate doing it, and and still, it it feels good. Jamie gave a small laugh. Well, what it comes to, Ian, is that your cock hasn't got a conscience, and you have. <laughs> Didn't trouble yourself, Ian. You couldn't help it, and it's likely that it saved your life. Didn't trouble yourself, Ian. You couldn't help it, and it's likely that it saved your life for you. The other lads, the ones who did not come back to the cellar, do you ken if they were virgins? Well, he thinks they were, and some boasted about having sex, but he doesn't believe they did. And then he asks if Jamie knows what happened to the other boys. And Jamie lies and says no, and asks if he can sleep, as they have to walk tomorrow.
He says he can sleep, but asks if he should not keep watch, because Jamie's been shot and all that. And then he says, I did not say thank you, Uncle Jamie. And this time Jamie laughs. You're very welcome, Ian. Lay your head and sleep, laddie. I'll wake you if there's a need. So he sleeps, and then Jamie asks if Claire will just sit with him, because closing his eyes helps his headache. What a sweet boy, and he's a fierce boy. I just love him. He and Claire sit for a while, and all they hear is nature around them. And then she asks if they would go back to Jamaica to get Marceline and Fergus. He thinks they will go to the Dutch island of Eleuthera and send Innes back with John's boat, and he can get a message to Fergus to go join them. He doesn't want to go back to Jamaica. And then Claire is thinking about Yi Chen Cho, wondering aloud if he'll manage. Oh, Jamie thinks he'll make a go of it, no problem. He'll probably go to Martinique, where there are Chinese traders. And Claire asks if he's mad because of the betrayal. Jamie isn't mad at him. And what he says, and it would be foolish to hate a man for not giving you something he has not got in the first place. He doesn't think that Yi Chen Cho had any understanding of him saying the things that he said, what they would do, but how can he hold him accountable based on the situation that they were in? And Ian twitches in his sleep and he snorts and rolls over and Jamie looks at him and he plans on sending him back to his mother at the first chance to Scotland. And Claire's not sure he's going to want to go back to Lollybrock after all his adventures. And Jamie doesn't care whether or not he wants to go back. He's going if I must pack him up in a crate. Are you looking for something, Sassanok? So she's looking around in the dark, and she finds her hypodermic case. And she flips it open to see there's one good dose of penicillin left. And Jamie thinks it's for him. He doesn't want that thing sticking him again. I'm not fevered a bit. And if you have it in mind to shove that filthy spike into my head, you can just think again, Sassanok. She says it's not for him, but for Ian. And she doesn't want to send him home to Jenny, riddled with syphilis and other interesting forms of clap. And Jamie has what? Jamie raises his eyebrows. Oh, syphilis, you think so? Because of how Galus was acting, Claire wouldn't be surprised if it was dementia. And that she had advanced syphilitic disease. But she couldn't really tell because Galus was off kilter anyhow. And thinks it's better to be safe than sorry. Jamie snorts with amusement. Well, that may teach young Ian the price of dalliance. And he says he will distract Stern while Claire tends to Ian in the morning. Because Stern is a good guy, but he's very curious. And he doesn't want Claire being burned at the stake in Kingston, after all. <laughs> she'll always be a whore, and she'll always be a witch. No doubt. I expect that would be awkward for the governor, much as he might enjoy it personally. I should not think he would, Sassanok. Then he asks for his coat. She gives him his coat and asks if he's cold. He's not. It's only that he wants to feel the bairns close to him while he sleeps. And he folds his hands gently atop the coat and its pictures. Remember, the pictures of Brianna are in there and the miniature of William. So he has Ian next to him and his two close to him. Good night, Sassanok. Woo! What a chapter! That was a full 25 pages yet again. And what Claire said about maybe John enjoying her being burnt at the stake in Kingston... What I wrote was, meow. She was getting her claws out there. What are your thoughts on all of this? Ian has been found, but he's obviously been abused. For all intents and purposes, Yi Chen Cho is free. Lord John Gray is going to be the governor of Jamaica for a while, at least. The Reverend Campbell is dead. Margaret Campbell is safe. Well, safe-ish, with Ishmael and the other Maroons. She has a place of honor. They have to reconnect with Fergus and Marcelie and Jared's boat. 
Brianna is safe in the future and Galus cannot get to her. Claire and Jamie are together. I think they need some R&R. &R. They need a couple of weeks on the beach with some rum and cokes. Well, there wasn't coke. Mm, with some rum. <laughs> and sunshine and ocean and a nice room to sleep in. It's not really their style to have downtime, but they do have some periods here and there. And I'm glad I miscalculated and have one more episode of the book with you guys until we're finished. So please, I want to hear from you. You can email me at adramaoutlander at gmail.com with comments or questions. You can call into the voicemail line and your message could end up on the podcast. 719-425-9444. You can find A Dram of Outlander all over social media. Instagram and Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander. Facebook is A Dram of Outlander page. It's public. And then if you search under groups, there's a private group just for listeners. And it's also A Dram of Outlander. The website, I know it's shocking, is a adramoutlander.com. <laughs> and you can also participate by sharing the podcast coming to the Wednesday night Twitter chat and I promise I'll do a Facebook chat soon I get into a rhythm and it's hard to find other spaces to fit things in Wednesday nights on Twitter it's hashtag ADOO and the only time I'll miss is if I'm baby catching and it's at 6 p.m. Pacific time 9 p.m. Eastern time and a reminder as soon as we finish Voyager we will be moving into the Scottish Prisoner because there's so much meaty information that applies to Voyager. But we really get to know more about Jamie and Lord John and Hellwater and some other adventures that are really fascinating. How can you support the podcast? Well, you can, again, tell people about it. Share the podcast on your social media. You can financially support the podcast with a one-time donation or through patreon.com slash a dram of outlander with a monthly donation that you give. And thank you, thank you, thank you. As always, it's a blast and I'm sad, I'm getting sad that the book is drawing to a close. It doesn't matter how many times I read it, I still just want to snuggle it up. <laughs> and please have a fantastic week. And until next time, slow java.